Ellie this morning. Um, this is Elderberries with Ellie from Lily Springs Farm. And just a couple housekeeping tips here. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. To ask a question, we have been having people write it. You can either write it in the comments section or go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask it directly to Al when the time is when the time comes. And we'll, we'll stop at the end uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes of questions. And if you are new to the Savannah Institute, uh, our mission is to lay the groundwork for widespread agroforestry in the Midwest. And we work in collaboration with farmers and scientists to develop perennial food and fodder crops with, within multifunctional polyculture systems that are grounded in ecology and inspired by the Savannah biome. The Savannah Institute strategically enacts this mission via research, education, and outreach. And thus the webinars, because we can no longer this season do in-person field days. So if you're interested in becoming more involved, please visit our website, which is savannahinstitute.org. You can join us at our other webinars, download our free book, Planting Tree Crops, or support our organization by donations. So I'm going to stop my screen share here and turn it over to Ellie. Oh, great. We have people from all over Wisconsin. We have someone from the UK coming in. This is all very exciting. So welcome. And Ellie, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Will do. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hello. This is very exciting to see all of your names and faces on my screen. Um, I wish this could be an in-person farm tour, but we'll make do. Uh, I tried to take as many pictures in the last few months as possible of what we're doing at Lily Springs so you can get a sense of um, what this all looks like. So uh, I'm Ellie Sullivan. I'm the farm assistant at Lily Springs Farm in Osceola, Wisconsin. I use she, her pronouns, and I've been there for about two and a half years, um, really interested in all of the emerging agroforestry uh, connections and really grateful to the Savannah Institute for being um, such a wonderful hub for all of us to, to uh, virtually gather these days. So I will just jump right in and share my screen. Um, I have to figure out how to do that. Michelle, do you have um, the option for participants to share screens? Yes, it should okay. be on there. Um, so okay. it's at the bottom. Did you find it? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so elderberries at Lily Springs Farm. We're going to cover propagation, planting, and care. Uh, you're welcome to ask about sort of more general elderberry questions. Um, I'm not really going to cover, you know, what, what uh, soil characteristics and, and um, general things like that are, but um, feel free to ask at the end of the presentation. Oops. All right, so Lily Springs Farm is a 100-acre regenerative agriculture farm in northwest Wisconsin, and we are dedicated to restoring a native food system that's based in nutrient-dense perennial crops. And we're working on that through sort of our, our tagline is regeneration, celebration, education. Uh, and that guides all of our enterprises here as we work to foster true personal community and land health and resiliency. Um, so that is done through holistic land management practices. Um, and we recognize that these agricultural practices directly affect our watershed. We're at the top of the Horse Creek watershed, which then flows into the greater St. Croix River watershed, um, which connects to the Mississippi, which connects to the Gulf of Mexico. So we're one tiny, tiny part of all of that, um, but we certainly recognize that we're part of this interconnected system and that requires a lot of uh, intention and care. Uh, we are also proud members of the Wisconsin Farmers Union, the Polk Burnett County, uh, is very active and, and we've loved working with them. So Lily Springs Farm, these are these are images of um, sort of our, our farm design. 
And it includes a variety of enterprises. We have silvopastured pastured goats, chicken tractors moving through our uh, hemp field. We're growing hemp for CBD production, uh, perennial crops such as elderberries, but also including medicinal and culinary herbs, nuts. Uh, we do a lot of educational programming um, for, uh, with kids from kindergarten through college and beyond. Uh, and then an Airbnb on site. Um, so some of the agritourism can help fund our regenerative practices. Uh, and then a lot of kind of in the margins and generally native prairie and woodland restoration on the property. So Lily Springs Farm is just the current steward of ancestral lands of the Dakota, Anishinaabe, and Ho-Chunk peoples. And for countless generations, this land was intensively and intentionally managed by, by those communities who lived and live here. And our practices as regenerative farmers are very strongly informed by indigenous methods of land management. And so we seek to listen to and learn from the land just as they did, uh, and they do. And so much of the knowledge, skills, and, and even foundational crops that, uh, center, that we center in this regenerative agroforestry paradigm um, come directly from indigenous land stewardship and cultivation practices. And elder is a perfect example of that. It has been widely used across um, countless cultures, time periods. Um, most people, when they think about historical uses of elder, are thinking about the European variety. Um, we have a lot of writings from Greco-Roman times, from Western Europe. Um, but that kind of erases the fact that uh, in North America, we have native elderberries and those elderberries uh, have been used for countless generations by, um, by a variety of peoples in a variety of ways. This is the people's medicine cabinet. So you can see, um, you can see some of these names that are uh, just indicative of all of the different uh, cultures that have incorporated elder, um, elder bark, elder berry, elder flower into their um, medicine cabinets, into their food sheds. And traditional indigenous knowledge of elder uh, and elder uses is most often passed down orally, which is um, partly why we have a hard time tracking that um, through written sources. But there are a few if you're really interested in it. Um, there's the Lakota names and traditional uses of Lakota plants, which is written by the Brule people, and Zuya's Life Journey, which is a collection of oral teachings from the Rosebud Reservation um, by Albert, Lee, Albert White Hat Sr. Um, elderberry, elderflower, this was incorporated into a lot of traditional foods, um, especially in the Great Plains region, especially in the region that uh, Lily Springs is in, this uh, upper Midwest area. So Lily Springs um, has four varieties of elderberry, all of which are American varieties, um, derived mostly from cultivars from Missouri and New York. So we have Johns, Bob Gordon, Ranch, and Wildwood. And just a brief note, because this always comes up in elderberry conversations, it's generally agreed now that American elderberry is just a subspecies of European elderberry, and there will always be debate about which is better yielding, which has uh, higher nutrients, less toxicity. We're not particularly interested in that conversation. The varieties we chose um, are varieties that work for our area, for our management strategies, and yield products that we prefer. So. Um, focus on that more so than, than um, adhering to a certain dogma uh, about like which types are, are better. Um, and the reason that we plant multiple varieties and we suggest planting multiple varieties uh, for, for many reasons. One, you get an extended harvest season for flowers and berries. Uh, you have some resiliency built in with that diversity, right? Um, a late freeze or a bad storm or particularly hard pest pressure might damage some of your crop, but you're not going to necessarily lose, um, lose everything that year. And then it's also been proven that you get increased yields 
when you have multiple species planted uh, or multiple varieties, excuse me, planted close enough together that you can cross pollinate. And some of the varieties that we've chosen specifically, Wildwood has massive flower heads um, over a foot in diameter, um, which we love. We, we mostly focus on elder flower just in these first few years of establishing the plant. Um, and the local market in our area, we have um, some really great folks who want to buy the flower more so than the berries. Um, additionally, all of our varieties will fruit on first year canes. Um, most, uh, all European varieties and some American varieties will not fruit on those first year canes. And those are the ones that are sent up via um, runners. Uh, and we like this, um, this characteristic of fruiting on first year canes because through pretty aggressive pruning and coppicing, we're encouraging our elderberries to hedge, to send out those, those first year runners. Um, and so we're not sacrificing our uh, harvest quantities by doing that. So for us, we're in zone a, uh, 4A. Our flower harvest lasts from early to July um, to mid-August. Berries are late July to late August. Keep in mind that's going to be um, heavily affected by the zone you're in, the varieties you choose, um, and then your management strategies. Uh, any coppicing or heavy pruning is going to slightly delay those harvest times. So, propagation of elderberries. Uh, we have um, the, the method that we use at Lily Springs, um, we coppice our plants. So coppicing is a uniform pruning uh, down of woody plants. This is a pretty aggressive prune um, in order to encourage vigorous and plentiful regrowth. And there's a few benefits. One, you get sort of uniform plant height, uniform fruiting height, uh, which makes for easier, more efficient harvests. You get larger um, signs or clusters of flowers and berries. You might get somewhat fewer of them, but because they're larger, uh, that's a more efficient harvest. And then, like I was saying, we have this rapid regeneration from both the root crown and uh, suckers that the plant sends out. And that's encouraging this hedgerow tendency, which elderberries have been included in, in hedgerows um, for a long time. It's a quintessential hedge plant. Uh, and that's ideal for regenerative farming, right? You, you can implement those hedges, you can uh, integrate them in so many different ways. Uh, you can free range poultry that can take advantage of the increased shade and predator protection. You can use it as, um, as a windbreak for livestock. Uh, you can incorporate it into sort of living fences um, that divide different fields and uses. Uh, and then the benefit of this aggressive coppicing, right, is that you end up with uh, plentiful hardwood cuttings for propagation. Um, probably, depending on how many plants you have, more than uh, you will know what to do with. So we coppice in the dormant season. Uh, you can do this anytime from like late November to early March, again, depending on your zone. Um, we prune February to early March, but the key is just before you have any bud break, which is when those leaf nodes on the canes start to break back open and, and new growth emerge from them. So we take hand pruners or sharp loppers and we do sort of an initial cane removal. So we're cutting um, 12 to 18 inches above the ground. You're leaving at least two uh, leaf nodes, those bud sets, um, in that right hand picture you can see uh, about an inch from the top there's a set of buds and an inch from the bottom there's a set of buds so want to leave at least two um, on those canes that you're chopping off from the ground uh, you'll get second year growth coming out of those um, and second year growth is generally agreed to be the most fruitful uh, year of, of um, flower and berry production so we have now, depending on the variety of your elderberries, if you cut a foot to foot and a half above the ground, you're left with maybe five to seven foot long canes that you've removed. And you can now start breaking those down into about one foot long sections. Again, what you're looking for is two 
bud sets. So that top one is where the new leaves will emerge and the bottom is where the roots will emerge. Uh, so you give yourself the best chance of having a successful propagation if you give yourself those two, uh, two leaf sets. We cut the bottom uh, part of the cutting at a 45 degree angle, um, as you can see in that picture. And that's for a couple reasons. One, when you're pushing that, um, that cutting into either your in-ground nursery, your raised bed, um, if you're overwintering in pots, um, that sharper point is going to give you a little bit easier um, push down into the soil uh, without just like tearing up the tender um, cut section of the plant. Uh, and then it also makes it really easy if you've got like a pile of cuttings um, to know which is down and which is up. Uh, it's definitely easy to accidentally, if you're going fast, you have a ton of cuttings to get through to plant your elderberry cuttings upside down. Um, you can look, if you, if you look at that bottom leaf node, you can see that it forms a, like a really shallow V. Um, but if you're going fast, it's, it's easy to, to not glance at that um, and end up planting your cuttings upside down. So we do that 45 degree angle cut on the bottom to just make it really easy to see, uh, really efficient to just get them in the ground uh, right side up. Uh, once you take your cuttings, depending on when you take them in the, in the late fall, winter, um, so you have to store them until the ground is workable. Uh, store them in a cool, dark place. We recommend um, a fridge. You could also do walk-in cooler or root cellar. Um, somewhere where they're going to stay relatively dry and cool. Um, you don't want them to go moldy. You also don't want them to accidentally start sprouting too early. Uh, and then you can plant them out once the ground is workable, but after the danger of hard freezes is passed. So it's recommended elder cuttings root out best in like high 30s to high 40s temperatures. Um, and again, thinking about those first year growth um, may or may not produce uh, flowers and fruit. So just check the varieties that you're, that you're using. Uh, second year develops lateral branches, most fruitful. That's why we like to leave two, um, two leaf sets on all of the plant, uh, cuttings that are, or on all of the canes that we, we cut down. And then canes older than three years generally become less productive, um, more prone to disease or damage. Uh, so you would want to cut those back if you're managing for production primarily. Um, if you're not uh, pruning or coppicing every year, at least prune or coppice every two to three years so you maintain the vigor of your plants. Okay, some more things to be just aware of and some adaptations that you could do off of our technique. Uh, remember that pruning approaches are going to vary depending on your variety characteristics. Is it tree-like? Is it shrub-like? Um, again, the age. We recommend not pruning plants until they've had a couple years of establishment so they can really focus on developing healthy root systems. Um, except for any diseased or damaged canes, you will want to remove those every year. And then there's another process for pruning called ground pruning. Um, and that is when you use like a brush hog or another mechanical approach to just uniformly take the plant down literally to ground level. So you're not leaving any of those um, leaf nodes to regenerate second year growth. This is efficient for larger plantings, um, obviously only plantings that, uh, that, um, that you can get uh, a harvest off of the first year canes. Um, and then you can leave that, that um, chopped down elder material as like in place mulch. Ground pruning can reduce the yields of varieties. Um, and you also just want to be careful that it is a pretty aggressive way to prune your plants. Um, but it does make sense for, for really broad acre um, plantings. You can also take softwood cuttings. That's when you um, propagate off of green shoots. Um, this is more time consuming. The cuttings do require a lot more care. They're a lot pickier about like moisture. 
um, and they take longer to root. We don't do softwood cuttings. We don't find them uh, worth it. So if you're really interested in that technique, um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience uh, to, to give you advice from. And then, like I said, you can root out your hardwood cuttings over winter in pots. Uh, indoors, you would want to take the cuttings earlier so they have time to establish over the winter before planting them out in spring. And again, we don't do that because we're we're propagating on such a scale that um, that would just uh, take up too much time and space, especially um, in our limited uh, our limited facilities. So once you have your cuttings, um, you can establish your nursery. So your nursery, you can plant out, like I said, once the soil is gently workable, but you still want it to be cool and moist. And in our transplant bed, we recommend six inches between cuttings. That gives them enough room to start to send out roots and foliage without getting overcrowded. Um, but especially if you're working with high quantity of cuttings, you want to be efficient with space. We use um, white flags to mark the changes in varieties since we are propagating multiple varieties in the same nursery bed. And ideally, you would be um, establishing this nursery somewhere that has uh, at least partial shade. Um, our nursery is not in the most ideal place, but it, it was the, the space that we had to work with that was um, most practical for us. So that just means you want to want to be extra diligent about um, keeping that soil moist. When elderberries are getting, when cuttings are getting established, it's really important that those um, new and emerging roots don't dry out. So for the first couple months at least, um, make sure that if you're not getting consistent rain that you are watering every few days. So our process for planting out elderberry cuttings, um, we soak the cuttings, um, just the, the bottom half, the part that's going to root. Um, we soak that in water for 24 hours prior to planting. And we typically will take five gallon buckets, um, fill them with well water, and then soak willow cuttings in those first for a few days. Willow has a natural rooting hormone. Um, you can also, you know, dip the ends of your cuttings into rooting hormone. Um, we choose not to do that, uh, but we like using the, the willow branches method. When you're planting into a nursery, you can amend the soil gently, but just be really careful not to add too much nitrogen. That's going to encourage um, foliar growth when the goal for this first year of establishing elder cuttings is, is um, just root establishment. So you want, the, you want to encourage the plant to send down um, roots and not uh, a ton of foliage. So we map out a grid. We pre-poke holes um, just to protect the tender tip of that elder cutting. Um, and then once they're all planted and, and you want to make sure that you bury that lower set of um, buds so that those can root out. Uh, we cover with a straw or you can do a finely chipped mulch. That has a couple benefits. You're helping retain moisture, but you're also suppressing weeds. Um, and elder cuttings are very susceptible to weed competition. Um, and then, so, so you want to make sure that even if you are mulching, that you are staying on top of weeds. Um, weed thoroughly, but weed gently. I would avoid using any um, hand tools if you can, because again, those roots are going to be really tender. Elder, um, in general, have shallow root systems, so it's easy to damage them, and you don't want to uproot them. And then as your plants get established, um, you want to make sure that you're clipping any flowers off um, before they get too mature. Again, encouraging the plant to send its energy to its roots to get established before it focuses on uh, production. So once your elderberries are in the ground in their permanent homes, um, you want to start thinking about how to care for them, how to mimic uh, the fertility cycles um, and the, the general ecosystem that they would experience in sort of the natural open woodlands that they typically grow in. So for the first two years of elder, we recommend harvesting the flowers before they go to fruit. Um, again, encourage the plants to send those roots down. 
And then we apply fertility once a season. We do an aged sheep manure around the base of each plant. And then we top that with King Strafaria inoculated wood chips. So in that far top right picture, you can see Drew Slevin, our farm manager, inoculating um, a, a truck bed of wood chips from our forest with um, mycelium. Elderberries are, all, all woody perennials prefer a higher fungal to bacterial relationship in the soil. Um, so we like to inoculate all of that uh, mulch with, um, with mushroom spawn. And then if you want, you can even turn that into a second enterprise um, happening below your elders. You want to still avoid the high fertility applications while those plants are maturing. Um, and then once they are mature, you can think about like a heavier dose of nitrogen earlier in the spring is typically recommended. Um, so like if you're moving chickens below your elderberries, that's a great combination to work with. Um, and then again, that mulch can suppress weeds, retains moisture. Um, weed management, uh, no matter how much mulch you use, you will still get weeds. And in, in the first, again, first few years of the elderberries, um, Hand weed, uh, the young plants are really susceptible to that root disturbance. And then once you have established plants, um, you might still want to weed aggressive weeds from within, hand weed them from kind of within those, um, the, the clusters of uh, shoots. But um, we use a weed whip just once or twice a season going along the edges of each hedgerow. Um, especially before a uh, fertility application, before fruiting, before harvest. Um, and that ties into pest management. So if you let your elders get really overgrown, um, you're not pruning, you're not managing weeds, you're going to significantly reduce the airflow in there and that can lead to a lot of problems. So spotted wing drosophila fly, SWD, um, the bane of all berry growers, including elderberries. Um, this is a fly that will cause your berries to ripen unevenly. They'll um, go bad very quickly. Uh, so airflow is the, the best preventative measure. Um, space your plants properly. Once you move them out of that nursery or once you move them out of, um, out of their starting pots, six to 10 feet, depending on the variety, is what um, most folks recommend. Also, depending on, um, you know, how quickly you want that hedge uh, characteristic to develop. Um, you can hang traps. There's easy DIY vinegar traps online that work pretty effectively. Um, and then uh, if you're dealing with like a really bad infestation or um, like a year that's just particularly heavy, consider just harvesting flowers. Don't let any of the plants go to bear fruit because that those berries are the vector for SDB. So if you do a couple of years of just flowers, um, you can kind of cut down on your local SWD problem. Um, when you are harvesting fruit, uh, or if any of your plants do go to fruit, make sure that none of that fruit is staying on the ground. Um, either move chickens underneath your elderberry to clean that up, or just make sure that you're always harvesting. When we're managing for both flower and fruit harvest on the same plant, we tend to take our flowers from the lower branches. Um, that's where if those clusters were to go to fruit, they would probably hang down and end up touching the ground um, and becoming an easier vector for pests. Um, so we kind of prioritize the most upright shoots as, um, as the fruiting canes and then the lower ones, the ones that are tipping over as the flowers. If you have a terrible, terrible infestation, you can consider using neem, but just really be aware of harming any beneficial insects. Our honeybees are very close to our elder plantings, so we don't want to use um, anything that could potentially harm our honeybees. Japanese beetles, another bug that could pot uh, potentially damage your plants. Um, if it's just on a few plants, you can pick them off into either a bucket of soapy water or just into a bucket and feed them to your chickens. Um, if it's a little bit worse, you can try like a diatomaceous earth slurry that's a little bit easier, 
more efficient. Um, you get a more even coverage than just sprinkling dry VE on your plants. Uh, again, really, really bad infestations, you can consider using neem oil or another organic control method. Um, folks always uh, mention bird pressure for their berries. Um, we experienced that. Uh, we've just kind of come to the conclusion that the birds are going to get a portion of the harvest um, and we're not dependent upon getting, you know, 100% of the berries out of the field. Um, so the birds can get their share. Uh, you can plant um, additional plants or, or create habitat and ecosystems for those birds to forage um, in and around your elderberries. Uh, providing that healthy, diverse ecosystem so they're not only eating uh, your crops. Um, and then you can net your plants somewhat less practical for, for really broad acre applications. And then finally, diseases, and I'm thinking primarily of fungal issues here, um, things like powdery mildew or rust. Uh, again, it's, it's all about the prevention, um, proper airflow, uh, don't use overhead irrigation. We don't use any irrigation on our elderberries. Um, we do have a water wagon that we can move through on particularly long, hot, dry spells, um, but for the most part, they don't need it. Um, they're pretty hardy plants. Uh, and then, so you could, if you did want to do irrigation, you could do um, a drip line or a soaker hose. Uh, pruning, again, helps with the airflow. And then good nutrition. Um, if those elders are healthy, um, they have strong immune systems, they'll be better able to fend off uh, disease issues. So just really quickly, um, I won't go too much into harvest. Um, that really depends on scale and your preferred products and all of that. Um, but general rule of thumb, Harvest flowers when at least 75% 75, 75 of flowers on that umbel are open um, and harvest after, um, you know, try to aim for maybe late morning after any dew, dew has dried, but before hot afternoon sun has started to wilt those flowers. And you want to immediately either get them into the cooler um, if you're selling or processing them fresh or a controlled drying space if you're selling or processing dried. Um, there are mechanical destemmers uh, being experimented with. Um, that's best for large-scale operations. Um, you can also destem by hand. It's a little bit more tedious. Um, and then harvesting berries when 95% of the berries are dark, 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 purple, black. Um, better to harvest umbels of berries that have lost a couple fruits, um, either to birds or just they were overripe and they fell off, than to harvest umbels that have a lot of green and green, red, unripe fruits. Um, shake off any tree frogs hanging out in there, bugs, and then you want to freeze or dry them immediately. Uh, elder berries do not hold well at like refrigerator temperatures. Um, and then once you've frozen or dried them, it's way easier to remove the berries from the stems. All right, so to wrap up, I, I just want to bring attention to the fact that the market is shifting and we're really starting to see that elder is an exciting, important crop for folks. Um, people who have not generally been interested in, um, in plant medicine and, and natural immune boosters, they're looking for more medicine in their foods and drinks, more preventative health, resiliency, immunity boosters. Um, the bark, the berries, and the flowers all have different medicinal benefits. And they can really easily be incorporated into so many different products. Uh, the cuttings are also really, really low cost, especially um, if you, you know, have a friend with some elderberry plants. Uh, it doesn't take that much time. It doesn't take that much space to get an enterprise like this started. So um, they're a really wonderfully accessible plant for, for small scale and home growers and even farmers trying to start, um, start an elderberry enterprise. Uh, if you're looking for more resources on elderberry, the Midwest Elderberry Cooperative is kind of a wholesale and distribution program. Um, 
and they're opening bigger and bigger accounts every year. Uh, folks are really starting to turn towards elderberry um, and elderflower for a different for a variety of different culinary and medicinal uses. Small batch value added goods makers, elderberry syrup, elderflower, they're selling out of elder products constantly. Um, and I just think that elderberry, elder is such a, a perfect plant for these times. It's, it's medicine for the people, it's medicine for the revolution, it's, it's medicine for the COVID area. So um, it's really exciting to be part of the, the growing cohort of farmers um, working with this plant and getting this plant back into the mainstream. Um, and I think that we're moving towards a time when this plant is going to be just as well known, just as heavily incorporated into, um, into everyone's uh, sort of daily medicinal and, and culinary uses as it has been in um, generations past across different cultures. So thank you so much to the Savannah Institute for hosting this. Um, and I think we have uh, some time for questions now if people have them. There are some questions and thank you so much, Ellie. That was amazing. I'm excited, yeah. I wanna grow elderberry. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple questions that I saw coming in. Um, how many acres is Lily Springs on? We are, sorry, I'm trying to get back to my Zoom meeting. Um, Take your time. Let's see. Well, Ellie's looking are. through that. I just wanted to quickly mention um, that Midwest Elderberry Co-op is somebody that we are doing three w webinars with, actually. And those are coming up in, well, off the top of my head, late August, and then two are happening in September. So definitely check out our events page for that. So if you're ready, Ellie, you can answer the question. Yeah. Um, okay, so Lily Springs is on 100 acres, although Wisconsin zoning is very weird. So 20 of those acres are in Mud Lake. And uh, we have sort of 40 acres of, um, of just uh, oak woodland forest and then um, an old pine plantation that we're working on uh, rehabilitating back to native oak woodland. And then on the other side of Mud Lake, we have 40 acres of agricultural, agroforestry installations. Um, and we have a few hundred elderberry plants um, planted in our south field, uh, which on that second slide was the sort of ear shaped, um, planted on contour, key line planting um, field that we had. Can you give more detail on leaf sets needed when propagating? Yeah, so, um, so with, uh, with that, um, with that cutting that you have, uh, if you remember the picture, there's the, maybe I can bring back that, um, I'll bring back that, uh, slide, but, um, So you can see it has this top uh, top leaf set, and that's what's going to to send out new growth. Um, so you'll have new branches emerge from that, and then the lower leaf set or the lower bud set, excuse me, um, if that's buried in soil and has enough moisture, you'll get roots coming out of that. So that's why you want to plant too. You can. Um, Roots will emerge from, from basically all of those. If you see the little speckles on, on um, the bark of the elderberry, uh, those are all spots on the bark that are willing to root, essentially, um, willing to send out roots. But you're going to have the most success if you have at least one set of buds buried in the soil. Are there any pics or photographs of before and after coppiced elderberry? You know, I don't have any of our field, um, but basically what it looks like, you know, if you're coming in in um, any time in winter, so all of the leaves have dropped. Um, our varieties are between 6 and 12 feet tall. Uh, and so you have um, rows of, of these scraggly uh, 
canes, and then once you come through in coppice, they're all at a uniform height. Um, coppicing is also a good time if you have any uh, canes that sort of left your hedgerow and are, are spreading out maybe into your alleys, um, that's a good time to just ground prune them and really aggressively stop that growth. And, and you can kind of train your elderberries um, to grow just in the hedgerow that you want them to grow in. So rabbit management after planting, do you cage or wrap your trunks? Oh, um, we have not had too many rabbit issues. Um, so it's, it's hard to wrap elder trunks because they are, they do have sort of that sucker growth um, tendency. Uh, so you, you wouldn't be able to keep any sort of cage around them for very long um, without potentially uh, like choking out the, that new growth. Um, you know, you can think about uh, having, um, having sort of integrated pest management approach where maybe you have um, a, a terrier or what we do to keep all rodents at bay in our spaces. We have a lot of gopher problems. Um, we encourage a lot of raptor uh, habitat. So we have raptor perches all over the property um, and we have not had significant rabbit pressure because of all of the um, eagles and hawks and such that patrol our, um, our fields. Working with nature, not against it. Exactly, yeah. And I will say, so elderberry are really resilient. And, um, you know, in the same way that if you prune them, uh, they're going to send up new shoots. We have had, um, you know, in, in winter, if you have um, heavy snow levels and then uh, a late a late winter and, and all your rodents uh, underground get hungry, they're going to come and start making tunnels through your, um, through all of your woody perennials and they'll chew off that bark. And if they girdle a few of your stems, that elderberry is just going to send up more shoots. Um, it can be frustrating, but, uh, but this really is a plant that, um, that wants to survive and, and it can come back from that kind of damage pretty easily. That's great. How do you bring your elder flowers to market without them wilting? We dry all of our flowers. Um, so we do a low and slow forced air um, drying in our barn. Uh, we spread them all out on racks. Um, they're still on the umbels when we dry them. Um, and our barn in the summer is hot enough that it's kind of like having them in a low grade, um, like heated dehydrator or, or oven. Um, but then with, with forced air, they dry in a couple days, super easy to destem, uh, and then we just sell the dry elderberry, or elderflower, excuse me. Do you have any experience with starting cuttings in a greenhouse in plug trays? We don't have a greenhouse on site, um, so no to that. We have started them in just a little like four to six inch um, planter pots. Um, but again, you know, that has never been on scale because we don't really have the facilities for that. Do cuttings need to cure or can they be planted directly after pruning? If you, um, the, the, the only concern with planting directly after pruning is um, if you're cutting the, um, if you're, if you're pruning at the same time that the ground is workable, then you might like be on the cusp of seeing some bud break. Um, but yes, technically you can literally, the way um, Terry Durham from uh, River Hills explains it, he says you can literally like prune and then just turn around and stick the, stick the cutting in the ground and it's that easy. Um, but uh, they don't need any sort of specific time period um, to, to cure. You just want to kind of hold them steady if you are going to wait. A superb talk. Thank you. Do you see that elderberry will be a climate resilient, will be climate resilient in a warming climate? How do they cope with long periods of drought or long periods of wet weather? Mm, I think elderberry are are key to having uh, a climate resilient agroforestry installation. Um, elderberry 
are they're just hardy plants like they're they're pretty willing to to suffer through um weather variations uh they tolerate wet feet so it's okay if they um are in prolonged rainy periods. Um, our elderberry are planted actually at the lowest point on that key line design um, in our south field. So the last two rows of them um, are, are kind of squishy and swampy almost all the time and they do fine. Um, and yeah, I think that they will cope really well with a warming climate because we're actually kind of at the northern, Lily Springs is kind of at the northern edge of, of um, their preferred zones. There are a couple varieties that can, uh, can produce in zone three, but most of them are actually more adapted to, to more southern zones. Um, and, and I think there are some adapted to zones as, as high as like 10. Um, so again, super resilient, um, compatible with a lot of different climates. Um, the only concern would be particularly long periods of drought but then again you can um you, you can reduce your need for irrigation by like finding the lowest points in your field and planting them there they like uh water edges so any marshland um riparian edges elderberry are a great plant for that and then they also can help with um you know erosion control and all of that all right and yes, this presentation will be available to view again. We'll be putting it on our Facebook page earlier or later on today, and then also it'll be available on our YouTube page um, in a few days. So just to answer that question, what is a good source for purchasing canes? Um, so if you're looking for, I would always recommend going as local as possible, right? Because then you're going to have um, varieties that have really like it's not, it's not just that you're getting a variety that is supposed to work in your zone, but then your local growers are only taking cuttings from the plants that are actually thriving. Um, Cause there's always gonna be variation even within those specific varieties. Um, that being said, if you don't have a good local source, um, the the one I know of it's, that has um, one of the biggest um, cuttings offerings is River Hills Harvest. Um, and that's, that's Terry Durham. That's connected to Midwest Elderberry Co um, Collective. Uh, and then, um, and then you can also like, elderberry is one of those plants that as soon as you learn to recognize it, you realize that it's in every ditch um, in the Midwest. So you could also, um, you would really want to make sure that you're positively identifying um, the, the, uh, black elderberry, but because um, that's really sort of the culinary medicinal one. Um, there's a red elderberry that's also native to this area that you don't want to um, grow for production. Um, but you can also take cuttings from the plants in the ditch. They're obviously harder to recognize in the winter, but what you can do is um, they're most obvious in um, when they're flowering. So you can either take note of where the flowering bushes are and then come back that next winter, or you can, um, you know, if they're like in a friend's yard or something, flag them, and then you can come back when it's the appropriate time to take cuttings. Um, and that's kind of a DIY renegade way to do it. You won't know the specific variety, but if you're, especially if you're just growing for home production, that's a good way to do it. I love that. <laughs> um, would you recommend an understory of some kind of perennial that also has a marketable value? Um, yes, I would. Uh, yeah, I think that um, I think that hardy herbs grow really well uh, in in collaboration with uh, elderberry. So things that are a little bit more tolerant of shade because they do once they are fully mature, produce a lot of shade. Um, but yeah, you could do uh, you could do medicinal or culinary herbs below that. Um, you know, a creeping ground cover can also uh, can also help with the weed suppression. So there's another stacked function for you. Um, and uh, and then again, thinking about these broader agroforestry applications, um, you know create really wide alleys so you can hay in between your elderberry rows or um, you can move grazers through. Uh, there's definitely um, a lot of ways to integrate different enterprises with these crops. Um, 
like I mentioned, uh, inoculate your mulch and, and do a, um, a mushroom harvest underneath them. So I'm gonna combine two questions here. Uh, what varieties would you recommend planting? And then do, mm -hmm. do you sell varieties so I can get started? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the varieties that we work with, John's, Bob Gordon, Wildwood and Ranch, um, I'd recommend all of them for slightly different reasons. Um, and yes, we, we will probably be selling elderberries in the fall, um, cuttings in the fall or, or potentially next spring. It just depends on what we're looking for in our nursery is to make sure that those plants have rooted out really well. So most folks recommend um, giving them one full season of growth if you're selling uh, like bare root starts um and then uh but then you know if if the roots develop really well then you could potentially um get them in fall and plant them um early enough in fall that they'll establish before um before the freeze uh but next spring yes we will definitely be selling um like bare root cuttings that are dormant and then you can either put them in pots or put them in ground i have seen cocoons on elders elderflower when the flowers are fully mature. Is this why you harvest at 75% open? I have heard that stems attach to the berry and produce off flavor when you de-stem frozen berries. Is this only a wild elderberry issue? <laughs> Sorry. Do varietal berries do not do this? Do they not do that? Okay, good questions. Yeah, so um, cocoons like, um, like we definitely see, you know, we're, we're cultivating a space that is really friendly to pollinators. Um, so yes, we do get uh, bugs and monarchs and everything um, nesting in our elderberries or our elderflowers. Um, I say harvest at at least 75% open. Obviously, you'd, it'd be better even to harvest um, when you have even more flowers open. Um, what we watch for is we try to harvest flowers every two to three days. Um, and uh, we'll harvest when they're only at 75% open if we see like rain in the forecast because that will pull a lot of the pollen off and the pollens where you really get like the flavor, that beautiful elderflower flavor and the medicinal benefits. Um, and, then, uh, and then you also wanna make sure that you're harvesting umbels of flowers before any of those flowers have actually started to set fruit. Um, so it's kind of like a fine line to dance. Um, and then as far as the stems, yeah, if you have too many stems in your frozen berries, it can get a little bitter. Um, and then people are also very worried about the cyanide in elderberry stems. But to that, I would say, like, if you have a couple of stems in your elderberry, you're not going to have a big problem. It's more like don't chew on very fresh elderberry cuttings. Um, but it does happen with, uh, with um, cultivated varieties, not just wild elder. Um, so that's why de-stemming once they're frozen or dehydrated is best because then you can um, actually get most of those stems out. Um, it's, it's a lot harder to get a clean um, separation when you're processing fresh elderberries. So I am echoing the next question, and maybe we can talk about doing something together next year when hopefully COVID is passed. Um, can we visit the farm when it is possible? Seeing how you manage is always better for me. Yeah, we would love to have everyone out. Um, that's actually been a really hard part of this year is we are, um, Lily Springs was established as an education and demonstration farm. So to not have groups out, um, almost every week has has been pretty heartbreaking so i would love to have folks out and maybe we can do sort of a round two elderberry propagation and care follow-up next year that sounds great let's just plan it. <laughs> okay um do the hawks and eagles eat your chickens they can so that's why um we don't actually currently free range poultry in our elderberry because our plants are not yet established enough to provide um big enough or, or strong enough protection from those um, birds of prey so what you could do is you could do um 
uh, you could either wait until those plants are mature enough that your chickens can hide in the uh, elderberry and and like chickens are jungle birds like these birds know how to protect themselves they seem like doofuses but they they if they pro if you provide them with the right habitat they um, can thrive uh, even if you have a healthy population of um, hawks and eagles around um, but you could also uh, get a similar effect with just moving chicken tractors um, underneath your elderberries. Uh, so we're currently scaling up our, our poultry operation, and that is the plan. So our alleys between our um, elderberries were planted wide enough that they could allow for a couple different uh, things happening in between them. So we have room if we wanted to uh, hay that space, we could. There's also room to move um, temporary fencing and move grazers under, but we could also get two chicken tractors side by side um, working those elderberry rows. And then they have plenty of protection from birds of prey, but they're also uh, able to access all of the um, bugs and dropped berries and all of that below the plants. So quick break in the questions here. We are almost out of time, it's almost 10, and we have about 20-ish more questions to go. So Ellie, would you prefer to continue answering questions or can people email you after? What's your preferred method for that? I'm happy to stay on if the folks who's, who submitted questions have time, but I don't wanna take up folks' time if they are um, off. I know it's, it's peak season, so if people have uh, farms to get to, I don't wanna take too much time, but Maybe we can keep going for another 15 minutes and then anything we don't get to, I can, I can even um, kind of answer all of these. I'll just copy all of the chat questions into a follow-up email if people prefer. Um, well, and this, like, uh, like I stated earlier, it'll be available to rewatch. Oh, that's right. That's right. So people cool. can kind of fast forward to this. Um, okay. I just wanted to make sure be, uh, honor, honor your time. Your time. Oh, well, thanks. But yeah, I'm happy to keep asking questions okay. or keep answering questions. Great. Well, and for people that do need to sign off, um, thank you for joining us. And you can watch the rest later. But um, you are all are welcome to stay. I'm having issues talking. Okay. <laughs> when you start cuttings in the ground, do you then transplant later with more spacing? Yes. So I said that the transplant bed is a six-inch spacing. Um, we will only leave those in for max one year. So come next spring, um, if we decide to wait that long, we, we are gonna pull a couple of cuttings um, early this fall, assess how well those roots have developed. We might transplant them out this fall. If we choose to wait till next spring, then like hard deadline, they're out next spring and we will plant at that recommended um, like six to eight feet uh, between plants uh, spacing. Because those roots will get crowded. Um, they are shallow rooted plants, but again, they spread those suckers. So they, they will um, spread out very quickly and we don't want them to get tangled up and start tricking each other out. Do you, do you experience any mold issues when you're drying in the barn? No, we haven't. So, so um, it's not a fully climate controlled space. Um, Again, stacking functions, limited uh, infrastructure. We have um, our, our drying barn is also sometimes our event barn. So uh, we, we don't have it fully climate controlled, but we found that with a couple of dehydrate or dehumidifiers running um, and some like large ground fans, um, like those big circular ones, um, we don't have any issues with mold. Um, the plants dry within a couple days. Again, that's a reason to harvest um, after the dew has dried. Don't harvest immediately after rain, right? Because then you're bringing in plants with a lot more moisture um, hidden in all the cracks and crevices and, and that can definitely lead to mold. Can I fall plant potted elderberries? Yes, um, so that's what I was just saying. Really want to think about um, giving those new transplants enough time to um, root and establish before any hard freezes come through. Kind of a judgment call based on your zone, based on like the microclimate of your um, your farm or your land. Um, but uh, I would I would definitely recommend getting them in like early fall, don't, uh, don't push it because it'd be really sad to lose your baby elderberries. 
Plant at the same time as garlic, maybe. Yeah, I think that's probably a good rule of thumb. What, what is the website for Lily Springs Farm? Ooh, I will put our website and like our social media stuff um, in the chat so that it's all there. I'll do that right now. Do you have local varieties? If so, why did you choose the varieties you have? So we have local wild varieties, but those are red elderberry. Um, when you're thinking about planting like nutrient dense foods, remember the darker it is, the better it is. So we want those black cultivars. Um, and uh, we chose ours. So there were, there are like three breeding programs. So there were three breeding programs in the U.S. to, um, to establish uh, cultivator cultivars um, from native elderberries. Uh, so Missouri, New York, and Nova Scotia. We have some plants that were bred out of the Missouri varieties, some from um, further up in New England. Uh, and we chose ours again for that, that diversity, that resilience. So we specifically selected varieties that all kind of flowered and fruited along a spectrum. Um, so we have this continuous harvest that goes for um, about a month for flowers and a month for berries. Uh, and then those varieties also all have slightly different zone preferences. So um, some of our Missouri cultivars are like hardy up to zone four, so we're kind of pushing the edge. Um, but then some are hardy up to zone three. Um, so then we have a little bit of resilience there if we have a particularly harsh winter. Um, but by planting those, those further south um, originating cultivars uh, and we are preparing for um, the warming climate and, and those cultivars are doing really well uh, even up in um, you know 50 below winters that we, we've experienced in the last couple of years so uh, yeah I always recommend plant plant on the spectrum for sure. Any idea how well elderberry does in saline soils? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, again, like it's a generally hardy plant. Um, and I think it, it does, it is more tolerant, um, more tolerant of, uh, like soggy and oversaturated soils than it would be of like sandy, um, low fertility soils. But I'm not really sure how, uh, saline would affect it. If you're planting in like an estuary condition or something like that, um, that'd be really interesting. I don't know how it would affect it. Try it out and report back to us. Yes, please. We would like to know. <laughs> we need to start a greater network, so. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Um, and then just to say this out loud, in case people aren't sure how to access the comment section, Lily Springs website is lilyspringsfarm.com. Hmm. And Lily is one L which took yes. me forever to figure out. <laughs> um, so best to start elder orchard with bare root plants or purchase cuttings and root yourself. You know, I, I think it depends on um, the timeline that you're operating on. Uh, bare root plants are very expensive. Um, you could get a dozen cuttings for the same price that you could get a bare root plant, um, like, a, like a couple year old bare root plant. Um, I personally am in favor of the, like, decentralized go rogue approach of doing cuttings, um, but I recognize that not everyone has access to that, and so, um, especially if you're starting, like, a smaller scale enterprise that you then eventually see growing, like, yeah, get two or three bare root plants of two or three varieties, um, really closely monitor them, figure out which ones are doing well, um, which ones are spreading most vigorously, producing the kinds of products that you want, uh, and then take cuttings from those and expand, um, expand with those plants that are, are not just um, compatible with your zone generally, but are really thriving in your specific soils, climate management practices. That's good advice. And I know, at least for the Savannah Institute, we, re we work really hard to partner farmers with consumers and investors. So if you're 
if you're somewhere within the Midwest, uh, you feel free to reach out to us as well to see if we can find any farmers that you can get purchase cuttings from. Mm -hmm. And the same, you know, Lily Springs next next spring will be um, allowing you to purchase from them. So definitely yes. reach out. Yeah, stay in touch. And again, you know, check in with uh, with local folks on the land near you, and maybe they have some elderberries that are just part of their hedgerow. Um, or they just have a few plants that they use for home medicine production and like do a barter or trade with them or, or um, you know, I'll weed your elderberries if I can take some cuttings this next spring. Like, um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to form, um, yeah, easy, easy connections with folks like that. And farmers always need help weeding, so. Yes, please. <laughs> All right, unless anybody has any last minute questions, um, we, we actually got through them all, which is great. And Ellie, you did a wonderful job, so thank you. Thanks uh, so much for hosting this. This was really fun. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, and, and same, yeah. We'll, we'll be visiting the farm next spring, fingers crossed. And, um, oh, someone says they do great in non-sandy soils, so that's good to know. They do, yeah, yeah. That, that only problem is if it drains too quickly, quickly and it doesn't have enough fertility um, but they are like fairly tolerant of um, of like mixed soils. We're definitely on sandy soil in Lily Springs um, which is why we're really careful with our fertility applications and, and really diligent about that but um, yeah. That's great. Well everybody have a wonderful day and get out there and plant and enjoy the weather and thank you so much. Well thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.